So there's the links that I'm going to cover, uh, go over today. Uh, those are the ones that I have to share. If anybody else does, then for most, you know, this is a collaborative, uh, you know, business casual environment, really. And so this has all the different information that you would need to know. So the big thing is, is that uh, they just put out a, just the other day, more information came out. It implements a lot of things for third party that work with them as well. Uh, so it has a, quite a wide range of information and communication technology in general. And I was doing more research into it because although it is EU, it's just like the GDPR that still affects U.S. companies. So that's another thing that they added on, it looks like, is like cryptocurrency, you know, banks and, and businesses. But so this is definitely something that, you know, especially if you're in the finance industry um, and some other related material to implement it. I'll actually go ahead and take a look at one of these. But I think it's definitely something to be be aware of, especially if you're in that industry. And then Caesar over here has been working, uh, looking more into CMMC and came across a different regulation called ITAR. So international traffic in arms regulation. So it's an international regulation that, yeah, I haven't dug into the documentation really. Uh, I did look up quite a bit of the information related to ITAR. So it does affect a lot of business, but it affects a lot more than I thought originally. Primarily, it was just to set regulations for trading you know, militarized equipment, especially mm -hmm. manufacturing of such. A uh, pretty huge document here, of course, for the whole regulation, but it breaks it down. So, you know, like ammunition and ordnance, handling equipment. So this is the actual federal regulations that it cites to. They also do a pretty good breakdown of this section of the federal code. What it appears is that any company that manufactures this stuff uh, would have to comply with this regulation, especially in the United States. And then you know, I could definitely see this being involved with some of the stuff with the CMMC, of course. So, yeah, and some of the different key requirements of it is like registration with the U.S. Department of State for manufacturers and exporters, licenses and other authorizations are needed uh, for controlled items, uh, restrict access controls uh, must be in place to prevent unauthorized foreign nationals from accessing controlled data or technology. Yeah, that's and what I was detailed saying. So you're talking about like restricted zones and, and you know, um, above and beyond most of access control stuff that we would typically see in like corporations. Yeah. Well, and this is also where the compliance side of GRC comes in too. You know, if you're working for a company being, you know, if they're dealing with this kind of stuff, like I'm sure they're going to let you know, hey, by the way. Oh, sweet. Okay. Yeah. I worked with it in my former life as a defense contractor. And yeah. If, if you're going anywhere in the defense contractor world, you'll you'll run into ITAR. Yeah, and see, I mean, it's just just like on the Wikipedia page here. I mean, it is very broad. So, um, regulated regulated by ITAR. I'm like ITAR. What is that? I just straight went straight to my phone, <laughs> searched it up, or anything related to arms or law enforcement, war, weapons, equipment. Well, it's not even a certification. That's just to like get permission that's to get a piece of paper that says hey you're on our list heard about the itar other than now when i started researching and i'm glad jeff knows a little bit because i do want to <laughs> so it's more on the business to become itar compliant and they don't call it certification they call it compliant um you know this is an actual regulation that you know is particular to what you're doing and uh, yeah making that just the difference on compliance is is a pretty big thing. Well, and they have an outline here. Uh, the wiki, I mean, there's a bunch of information that's out here. You know, breaks down anything and everything to do with you know what is involved with it and what you have to do with it as well, in regards to that. But you're not going to have to worry about like what you have to do about tanks or whatever it is. And then also, like you said, I mean, like they give you a checklist or something like that along those lines. It's like if they, when they do uh, audits and stuff like that, like what type of framework they use? Do they go ISO because it's more international or they stick with NIST or like? Uh, what I would assume is, um, you know, like uh, Jeff mentioned about a checklist is so it's about compliance with the regulation. So it's a regulation, not really a framework. So it's legal code that says, you know, hey, uh, they're going to go through and they're going to check to make sure that you're doing everything that you're supposed to do regarding firearm manufacturing and exports and how you're storing them and all that kind of information to ensure that you're compliant with the regulation. Uh, there's not gotcha. like a spreadsheet of controls for it. And since it's so broad, I wouldn't imagine somebody would be, you know, an expert on the entire regulation. 
But, you know, you could read the whole section about ground vehicles, for an example, or guns and ammunition ordinance. So that way you're familiar with those sections of the ITAR. And I believe a lot of the different sections are going to coincide, like how you store documents, what you have to report, you know, the different reporting requirements. Yeah, this is a completely different level because this is, you know, DOD regulations. Like, yeah, so like ITAR visitor requir requirements are guidelines for controlling access to ITAR controlled areas or information by foreign nationals. You know, the regulations and things like that are kind of interesting. Uh, I've been looking way too much into the privacy laws lately. Yeah, and that's a great point to make. That's actually what it outlines right here is that really know what they even did until you went in their shop or otherwise. So, and it's because of thing, regulations like this. And then the zero trust webinars that I plan on going back over. Like you can always pivot to the other one. You know, if you specialize with AWS and then you get a job for Azure, you can always start taking their courses and content. So uh, I would say AWS and Azure are the two biggest one, and Azure is probably going to take market share, like we've discussed a few times. But I, I mean, it just like we talked about uh, before is that Azure is probably going to end up taking market share just because it's easier. That was the main reason like I didn't start working more on the Azure stuff. Azure versus AWS and uh, Google Cyber Professional. One cloud provider may be better at something else than the other. Something else I have heard about is a company may have something on Azure, but then they have other things offloaded onto AWS. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and drop this article in on YouTube as well. Pretty good. Actually, let me see. The last one that I took, it was social engineering. They are certified. What do you guys think? And I think I'd have spoken to you about this too, Chris, about the Asaka certificates. You know, it's not cheap going off and getting certificates and certifications, uh, but there is a difference between the two. And like I've personally seen the CCAK for the cloud auditing knowledge uh, on re job resumes, uh, COBOL certificate programs that they have. You know, you still get the name of ISACA on it. You know, you, you, you get the exam, but even the courses, if you buy the courses, it's like less than six hours. That's one that I was looking to actually take, but I like these certificates too that they have there through, through ISACA. Um, yeah. I think that just getting that, it's good fundamentals, but um, definitely I know that everybody wants a sec plus for jobs. And it's uh, the way I'm, the way I'm looking awesome. at it is not, is not what you say is how you say it. Cause you can honestly position that Asaka certificate. You know, like the whole point of going off and getting that certificate would be to set yourself apart from the rest of the job market. You know, like I've said it before, like I've learned more about the auditing process and so forth by going through PBO's videos and reading through the nest documents than anything else they're actually um they need to be certified by itar i'm like ITAR, what, like what is that yeah, i have yeah. no idea like i search it up reading the stuff fast just because we we're in a party uh and my head just popped up uh cmc that's the first thing that came up even in the internet cmc mm -hmm. versus itar yeah um and then i go yeah try to get me an interview there i told them i'm new i'm learning I'm, mm -hmm. a, I'm a fast learner. Just just get me in there. That's why I told them. Just get me in there. I working with lawyers. A lot of times you read contracts like we were reading the DPA, data processing agreement, stuff like that. If you're doing guns and weapons, you would have ITAR language in there and talk about it. Yeah. I mean, and it's kind of fascinating. Uh, it's really it looks like it's going to be pretty important to at least understand, you know, what it is especially if you're going to be working around CMMC, but um, definitely on the compliance side of it. Most so I just looked into it a little bit today. But a lot of times, I like said, I, 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 I think it's going to get you past auditing. I mean, I'm sorry, HR. But when you go into mm -hmm. a in Su Suchi, I think they're going to be harder on you. So I don't know. So the cert part is still definitely a big issue. Yeah. My only problem with getting the certificate is the fact that it's still a certificate. Like this is only... Uh, for this cybersecurity audit one, uh, mm -hmm. it's only eight hours of training. I mean, you still get the ISACA name on there. I think it's going to look good still. Mm -hmm. But like if a job requires, uh, you know, uh, CISA, and then they see that you just have a certificate for cybersecurity audit, I see you have the certificate and you don't have the CISA, you know, could you explain this to me or something? Is a time. You know, if you this could get a model. model. If you study for the CERP for eight hours, you think... I'm sorry, cert studying for the certificate for the eight hours. A lot of people study that much for the for the cert for the certification. Support. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, uh, the ISAC membership I think is worth it. Uh, if you are going for GRC, you know, audit, 
risk, you know, that kind of stuff. If you plan on getting at least one or two of their, their certifications, I think it would be worth it. Um, if you were InfoSec, I don't think it would be worth it. InfoSec, I think, is definitely more I, uh, IC squared. But yeah, you get access to forms. You get all kinds of different documents. You get access to uh, on-demand courses, the previous webinars. Um, I know for CISP, so I'm thinking this is similar to that. So you got to get your continuing aid credits. I keep saying I'm going back to uh, engineering and do the cloud, but then I say that and I start getting PSTD or something. So but that uh, um this morning uh on the morning brief he says that basically if you don't even have a certi uh, certification right now, you can actually get all this um uh. So CompTIA states on their uh page all about the CPEs that it has to be after the time that you obtained your certification. And then it also has to meet several other requirements as well. So like after you get the SEC plus, you can do the lives for it, but it would have to be dated after. Well, I like to clarify that information. Uh, uh, it's just you. like a lot of people don't understand that you also should check the material that you use for CompTIA. Yeah, but I looked into it quite a bit because there was actually somebody else uh, who makes training courses that uh, I was explaining to him because his uh, training course a lot of people I've noticed, uh, they just don't even know about it. And so if you read the fine print when you sign up, they actually have a link to this page in the fine print. And so unauthorized training material, and this basically walks through what could happen to you. You could get banned for 12 months. You could you know, not be able to get any CompTIA. You could lose your certifications. But so like with CompTIA, you sign into the web panel and you go through a process that adds CPE. So you say where you got it from, what it was, was it a course, a video, so forth. And then you have to supply uh, a document that proves that you did do it. Uh, so that could be a screenshot of you in live chat. It could be a comment on a YouTube video, um, or it could be your cert certificate for completing a course. And then uh, you have to outline like what domains make it qualify for CPE for your certification. So like I've, I've set plus. And so like when I took the cybersecurity 101 from Gerald Dozier, but, but yeah, I mean, it, this, the instructor has to detail like, oh, this is how many hours this course is. So for Gerald's course for the cybersecurity 101, that comes out to 22 uh, CP, CPUs, CPEs. Okay. And so if you look at the requirements for CompTIA, you don't have to be on the live in order to collect CPE. So if you have a certification through CompTIA, you can actually leave a YouTube comment and then just take a screenshot of that, of you, you know, completing the video. And that does actually meet requirements. So like if he does a two hour video talking all about 853 and it's for ISACA or something, you know, let's say it qualifies for the domain for the certification. I could go ahead and comment on that video, screenshot that and upload that as proof and evidence that I watched the video. Yeah, this is the page that outlines like how you can what needs to be on certificates and how you calculate that out. And yeah, so at least 50% of the course content must relate to one or more of the exam objectives. Out of the 40 required to renew your your SEC plus. Uh, real quick, he said, PBO, question. With your experience, do you think that someone that is entry level but may have some varying work experience coming into your company? I don't have a company, but <laughs> is that difficult to teach them infrastructure and get them caught up rather than someone with years of experience. That's the hot thing. Now, a lot of people want assessments on AWS. So if not have 30 years and you have 20. I'm Sarbanes-Oxley. And yeah. then just because I was in banking credit card business for, for so long, mm -hmm. I decided to take a course on PCI. Okay. Yeah. So that's where I'm trying to lean into that. But, okay. you know, now for entry level, they want five to eight years usually. And then, we the other company I used to work for, we had lawyers specializing in GLIBA. So I think that's kind of a, a unique skill set. But now, especially going into the PCI, I think you sitting right there. Are you trying to get in? Or are you in or are you doing PCI work now? Um, so I took a course, I did some consulting work, but I still need more like experience wow. as far as being with the company permanently. But yeah, I thought a company probably would pick you up because you got the yeah, you would think it's easy. Yeah, just because PCI is such a such a niche, like not everybody wants to go through that. Not every really, everybody everybody yeah. really cares for it. Like I said, I don't, I don't think I know anybody in the PCI DS world. Um, I know people who have studied for it, and I know one person who did pass the test because they were interning for PCI. Um, I hear there's a lot of work out there in PCI. I guess I never went in, in indeed and put that in there. 
and it, and it used to be like if they hire for that position, it used to be specifically just for PCI. And now the trend that I'm seeing is that they want you to do everything, you know, PCI, NIST, just uh, pretty much get your hands dirty. Yeah, and that's where they derive a lot of the stuff for PCI too. It comes from NIST. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, really uh, copy and paste for exactly. HR. Like it's NIST, HIPAA. So. And that's why I did that uh, compliance playlist. I think those are the top 10 um, compliances at a high level you should understand. Pretty much anything. I, I would prefer remote. I actually like being home and working from the office, but uh, most of the jobs that I've been getting called for have been hybrid positions. Companies, mm -hmm. and they basically said that if you don't have uh, actual physical employees in the office, let me get my money back in other sense. Yeah. So now a lot of companies I, are making people go physically to the office. I mean, like back in November, they were saying that less than 14% of IT related positions are remote now, and yeah. that number has been declining. So yeah, I mean, and yeah, I think it's definitely something that's disappearing, you, you, and you. and it seems more difficult too. You know, oh. um, some of the people I've talked with, you know, they submit uh, hundreds of applications and they don't hear anything back. I mean, that's because like everybody wants remote. That's why those ones are getting so much more. Uh, I think you mentioned it last week on the fact that like if you work on site, oh, I, yeah. I mean, people in your area is even in cybersecurity. Yeah, and I think it really came out of demand. You know, businesses had to work remote. Once I figured out. The companies that own real estate wanted you to come back. I think the issue is, um, I'm going to beat up on the baby boomers is, and I'm that way. I'm MBA trained. They train you to work for, talk to people face to face. I think the new paradigm is you, you need a paradigm shift because you communicate differently. So I'm trying to master this communication of doing GRC remotely. So what does that mean? You can bring up, a, uh, and I'm going to start doing this on my videos is, bringing up an architectural diagram, y'all can both look at it and draw on it at the same time. So there's a lot of communication things I think oh, you can yeah. technology sake that we're not doing. And I, I don't think, shout out to baby boomers, I'm beating them up. Let me answer me a question real quick. How do you see AI threats on critical infrastructure? If you got to cross do an assessment on this topic, I um, know AI is such at the top of the pyramid. I always talk about Maslow pyramid. Yeah, we ain't even handling fishing right now. You talking about AI. But no, I think AI, the, the basic thing and the low-hanging fruit from AI that is excellent at, the phishing emails are getting so much better from AI. Man, we had our um phishing things were were at were at 30 percent. Our click rate for our phishing test was 30 percent because the AI uh emails. So we so from an AI perspective, it's not even the top of the pyramid, but those those target coupons, boy, they were eating them up, man. We were they were killing our fishing test, man. We would tell them two weeks, we we're doing a fishing test. 30% target, man. They're clicking on it, man. So I don't even think we're getting at that that high level. So from from an AI threats, I think we ain't even talking about Caseas and doing something novel. I just think it's AI is killing us on a fishing test because they look yeah, I think it's the newest thing, man. And the newest thing I always gets the high thing. And let's be, when you talk about critical infrastructure, it's just a high new thing. So I think, and that's what sells. Because, you know, if you're a CISO, that's the stuff they want to hear. That's the stuff that sells. And hell, Toaster's got AI in it. So I just think that's the new. Uh, I think from a basic thing, I, and, you know, old football, I mean, we got a block and tackle before we try flea figure, man. I, we're not doing, like Chris said, we need to get some basic MFA in there. So I would like to see a little more better network segmentation. You know, the big nail that's hot in, in uh, Biden had it even in his White House. We're not even doing zero trust, really, at that level. And every product has zero trust in it. So there's a lot of basic things, man, I think we need to hit really. It's not, and I try to talk about it. I mean, there's some basic things, in MFAs and zero trust. Um, even though my favorite one, Cisco Duo, just got hacked. Just checking the, checking the health of your laptop or your phone before we let you connect to the network. Do you have the right patching? A lot of people not even doing a basic health check before they let them get on their network. And that's some of the basic stuff of zero trust. We're not even doing that. I mean, well, AI has been around for how many years? And, you know, people, like it was nothing. In a proper manner and understand what AI is going to do rather than just scaring people. It's, it's beneficial. A lot of people use AI now. You have to understand what's exactly that AI is going to do in a way that AI is harmful and it's going to take a lot of jobs. It, it can't even do its own job. Yeah, but like we talk about sometimes, and I, I need to do a better job about, about that is, 
we need to assign AI a risk about where it's at, what it's touching. A lot of companies have uh, policies where you can't put PII or a company's uh, proprietary information in AI. So a lot of times, a lot of departments, we can't even let it use AI yet because we're scared to put our data in there. So then what's the risk if you're not using in those um, critical areas for PII, HIPAA data, if it's not touching that? So, so I think we just need to assign it the proper risk for your company. And I think a lot of times it's going to be low. Now, once again, from the outside, what you getting a phishing attack generated from? Yeah, I think it depends on the company, of course. But I mean, like I had even heard, I came across an article about how the federal government was already working on systems to implement a AI network for the military's internet. But they're already implementing like an actual AI system to use across the government agencies. I mean, obviously, like it, it's it's how you implement it, not the product itself. I do but. have a question, not AI related, Liz, before I do forget. <sighs> and it's great that we have a lot of people in the industry. Um, I don't want to call it like sucking up or anything, but when you get a job. I think for me that actually stand out is um, understanding what the business wants from me. Um, especially at certain types. Older people don't want to do anything extra. <laughs> so a lot of times from your job. And two is, and I think that's where YouTube and different things, um, that you have insight where people been in the job, want, like ITAR. If you had a certain job and they bring up ITAR and you have a basic understanding, you would be ahead of a ton of people. All right. So I think you get into some nuances a lot of times, especially in GRC, where you can actually uh, show your worth. I guess, like once again, with ITAR, private telecom, and there's a ton of stuff in 800 at people just hit the surface of but when you really drill down to it. Like me and Chris was looking at that DPA and it looked like we gave all our rights to our data to another company, right? So a lot of people don't really understand what that is. So if you bring stuff like that, especially if you're a large company, that, that helps you stand out. All right, time, but I don't, I don't have any companies, but no, I know what he was saying. But so no, those are some things. And, you know, when I just got my current job, they were um, impressed because, Number one, I ask questions. Number two is I try to interject where appropriate. I will say like when I join a company, I, I typically try to stay back and learn as much as I can, try to learn the infrastructure, get a grasp of what um, everybody is like. And that talks about the statistics of it, AI being used in business across multiple industries, and it's just becoming more and more common. So it's just additional like security requirements and standards that you have to follow. Well, so it's just like, yeah, it's just like with the uh, GDPR, you know, we have to worry about that in the States because of it. And so this is just another thing. So finance, so I'm pulling it back up here, but we'll have to worry about it. It's the Digital Operational Resilience Act out of the EU. Uh, White House briefing for cybersecurity, which I was surprised. I've never seen a name framework in one of those. I think it's going to happen before then because we just getting wore out in cybersecurity. I feel like we lose every every day. Oh, always you're like four or five people get hacked. So I don't know. I'll go both ways. <laughs> and he outlines the history of security and computers and how it's failed over the last 20 or 30 years. The internet wasn't really meant to do business, right? It was meant if we was in a nuclear attack to be able to fail over and run to and run it separate. So I think we built all this stuff on top of the internet and it wasn't really built with security in mind. So we trying to bolt it on. I mean, we got it. I mean, we hooking the refrigerator up to the internet. We hooking banks. I mean, every, everybody, you know, cars, Tesla. So I think, so, but I, I understand what he's saying. So, but I think that's why we struggle with security. Nobody planned these businesses and, and, you know, people building all this stuff out, didn't plan and implement security from the get go. And that's just hurt us in the long run. Uh, like you said, the internet wasn't even designed for doing business in the first place. And it's just like patch over patch over patch kind of thing. It, it, that's just where like, you know, having, you know, the properly skilled people, you know, entering the industry and, and upskilling and everything else, you know, uh, as more threats become, you know, come out and AI and, you know, it's, with the people that I've talked to in industry who have been, you know, some of the people in industry for 10 years or more, it can be very complicated when you're running teams and, you know, doing security, you know. The CTOs and the business people will take you behind a woodshed because you're stopping progress. You're stopping money with your little security stuff on. So you become, it becomes a battle. 
right? So we talked about that. What is that? So a lot of times we don't play nice with each other. This privacy kind of spun off in its own area now. So security and privacy be yeah. butt sometimes. So uh, it, it, it's it's just a big domain. And that's one reason I'm a little confused why the gatekeepers keep blocking everybody. It seems like we would get more talented people, people with different perspectives, but we blocking people to get in the industry. Go ahead, Chris. That's my soapbox. Yeah. You know, it like you said, I mean, like privacy went off on its own thing. You know, you you have a whole subset of different things. In the, and uh, whether you're talking about GRC or cybersecurity, InfoSec, um, it's such a broad domain. Nobody can be an expert at, at, at it all. And, and like, you know, it takes those people who are really good at those different topics to work together in a team to actually implement something correctly. You know, having somebody who does privacy, having somebody who does policy and and having one person do it all is just not feasible, really. Oh. correctly yes but and to i've signed a ton of non-competes in my life so i'm gonna kind of do that with grc and cybersecurity and talk about that they're hard to enforce on security people because it, you know you're not so, getting proprietary information from a company right it's pretty much baby but i was going to talk about that from the cybersecurity perspective yeah it's what it really comes down to is who has access to it and who's going to use it the information is going to be used regardless but it depends on who's going to use it I told you I had a couple of lobbyists say negative things about me. So that's what I, when my eyes quickly woke. Well, long story short, I, I was attacking Microsoft in a, I think it was a $10 million deal for the state of Indiana. Then so people came to see my, my, my boss <laughs> about me. So, so yeah, that was, I was surprised <laughs> to see like little old me starting trouble. So, but now they got the cloud Alliance out there. I still ain't done a video on that. We were talking about that at work, the cloud Alliance. Do you want to do a uh, PBO seriously do something in ITAR and as well for like not the not if anything like the first 90 days, but you can do something like in the first week of work. What should you do like in the first week of work? Um, Yeah. And, and, and hey, uh, you know, that ITAR things like should be at the bottom of the pile. I've, I've sent like 20 requests to PBO already. Like oh, yes. I would be looking at like the 30, 60, 90 day, you know, so forth. You know, like if you go into ITAR, it's going to be way different than if you go, you know, to a different business that's doing something else, like what your job role is. And I think there could be tip, tips and tricks across the industry, but. Um, yeah, that's the thing I was going to start doing is going back through and doing a new. Yeah, I mean, that sounds like a plan. Yeah, basically all I'm doing is just working on the CIPP. I was doing a little bit for the. Um, certified cloud practitioner for AWS. Uh, it should be, uh, I should be probably publishing it within two to three weeks. Uh, we, I have people working on that, but the main reason for it is, you know, Ghost is a little bit restrictive. We'll still have the newsletter itself, but then people will be able to register. And one of the big things I wanted to do is I love Trillo. I'm working out the details and looking for feedback and everything else too, but basically putting together an entire resource center, you know, almost like a Wikipedia sort of, uh, for GRC and surrounding areas. And so there's several discords and people and so forth. Uh, so that way you could share that and keep track of like where you contribute and, and so forth as well, where, you know, people keep getting kicked off of it or, you know, uh, whatever happens with Trillo, you know, later on in the future. Uh, that's also why I was looking at AWS because we're going to go through AWS for it. Uh, so I honestly don't know. Uh, so one benefit is, so it is definitely going to cost money, uh, of course. Uh, but why? <laughs> um, so it's it's more for scalability, but then also just added benefit for the community. But having the ability for people to register as members, and then it's easier to keep track of what people do and how people contribute. And then putting together an official resource center all together would be really useful. Right when I start getting a little more experience and knowledge and stuff like that, I will actually want to start doing, I guess, frameworks. I so just uh, just just for uh, just frameworks. At that point, is just literally grab it and start using it. Which well, so is... so basically, we're going to swap everything over to our own thing. So we're going to have the website publish out, and then we'll be able to do project pages, and we'll have a resource center that will have uh, different resources. So I'm playing around with ideas. So after the website actually gets released and we get the bugs figured out, I, like I'm jumping through different ideas, like a form or like a Wikipedia or you know different options like that. Yeah, a high level view, and then also like a resources page for CSF, for an example. Um, and we could do that for each framework. Like uh, it would definitely be high level, and then resources going outwards, uh, because it, 
the intent's not to uh, reinvent the wheel. Like there's plenty of content out there already. It's just putting it where people can find it. And then also there are ways that we can make it easier for people to understand too. You know, a lot of the stuff like PBO has already done. I was thinking about doing is I want to get, so my wife said that I'm kind of nerdy about it, but <laughs> what I was thinking about doing is I'm going to get temporary tattoos that are hashtag team GRC for temporary tattoos to hand out. Have you thought about doing study GRC shirts and the bottom says um, team SE? But for ne co doing conventions and networking, like I said, um, cause you were there when the guy sh showed up for, um, I'll probably start going to, but oh yeah. So I, I, I try to pick it. I'm certain, uh, I think I'm going to one in third Tuesday of next week to uh, OSINT one, I think it is okay. that I signed up. A good thing you can um, meet a couple of those that can kind of get you on a list and start funneling stuff to, to you. Yeah, yeah, man. I like, uh, shoot, if I'm able to get that interview and get that job, why not? Like one, I, I want to get into cybersecurity so bad, man. It I, just, I'm doing everything right now. I'm going hard with uh, the sec plus. Well, and honestly, especially with you newer to the field, like they're not going to expect you to be very familiar with ITAR. Like it's not something that you really have to spend a bunch of time on. Yeah, I would certainly get a little familiar with it to an extent, like understand some of the major highlights, but um you know, focusing that time on that sec plus 